Very pleased to have with us today Guillermo Canela de Souza Godoy, Chief of Section of the Freedom of Expression and Safety of Journalists for UNESCO. Uh, as you know, World Press Freedom Day is tomorrow, but uh, already today there's an event in the GA Hall about this, and uh, Mr. Godoy will uh, we'll talk to you about that. Thanks very much. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, pleasure to be here, and uh, especially in a day that is a day dedicated to you, journalists, the World Press Freedom Day. So. Happy World Press Freedom Day, which is actually tomorrow, as uh, he just said. But uh, we are having events and uh, different discussions all over the world. I mean, the main event was, is, is taking place in the UN General Assembly Hall uh, today. But we have more than uh, 60 events in 60 different countries uh, throughout the week. And here in New York, there are more than 40 off-site events uh, that started actually yesterday and they go all the way to Friday. So this year is a particularly special moment because it's the 30th anniversary of the proclamation by the UN General Assembly of May the 3rd as the World Press Freedom Day, following a recommendation of a major conference that took place in Namibia in 1991, uh, where all the stakeholders uh, discussing how to foster press freedom after uh, the fall of the Berlin Wall and uh, the dissolution of the Soviet Union, came with this iconic declaration, the Vinduk 1991 declaration, underlining that our role, not only the United Nations system, but uh, all the stakeholders, is the protection and promotion of a free, independent, and pluralistic media. So through, throughout those 30 years, we have been uh, stimulating policies uh, to try to guarantee those three pillars, the independence, the freedom, and the pluralism of the media. Um, this year, there is also a coincidence of this 30th anniversary with the 75th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So the main thematic of the World Press Freedom Day in 2023 is freedom of expression as an enabler of all other human rights. So really the key message we want to discuss during all these different events that are taking place, including this one here at the UN headquarters, uh, is the central idea that freedom of expression is at the same time an individual right, but is also a collective right. When a, a journalist is killed in a particular uh, city or in a particular region, it's of course his or her right to freedom of expression that is being eliminated in the most cruel way, but is also the freedom of expression and freedom of information of their entire community that is being eliminated. And um, the, the element here that, uh, of course, I, is obvious for you, journalists, it's not that obvious when we are uh, defending freedom of expression that freedom of expression is fundamental for the guarantee of other rights. So UNESCO is launching today special analysis based on VDEM data on how freedom of expression co correlates very strongly with the protection not only of civil and political rights, which is maybe more obvious, but also with social and cultural rights. So basically, uh, I mean, the correlations are as high as 81, which is really a high level of correlation. So basically what we, what you can portray it if you are an alien coming from another planet to Earth, and uh, you want to decide where to live and you care about all the other rights, is a good idea to pick a country where freedom of expression is well protected. Because the chances that you will be going to have good protections on education, health, uh, mobility, not suffering other kinds of violence are very high according to this data that we are releasing today. So this is, this is a positive aspect uh, of what we are discussing, but of course, Unfortunately, the key message is that freedom of expression is under attack everywhere. Um, and freedom of expression in, in general, but press freedom in particular. So we released the global uh, statistics last year that 85% of the world population have experienced a downsize in their freedom of expression in the last five years. So unfortunately, there is a tendency of going backwards on that. 
Um, last year, the, the data regarding the killings of journalists, according to the combinations of the UNESCO uh, Director General, have increased 50% compared to the previous years. So it's also an increase in the number of killings. There are particular problems, for instance, regarding the online harassment against women journalists. Uh, our data shows that 73% of the women journalists we have interviewed for this particular research communicated they suffered online harassment in a way or another, uh, of which 20% communicated that this online harassment had a, a consequence uh, outside of the virtual world. Mm -hmm. We have also, and I'm almost finishing with the key different angles of these unfortunate attacks to freedom of expression. A recent UNESCO survey has shown attacks of, against journalists covering protests in 65 countries in all regions. We also have recently published data showing the misuse of the judicial system to harass journalists uh, in all regions, with 160 UN member states is still keeping freedom of expression under criminal codes, I mean defamation and other sorts of criminal typology that can actually lead to journalists' imprisonment, uh, which is another indicator on the rise. And then in some regions of the world, we are witnessing this phenomena that is being known as ISLAPS, strategic uh, lawsuits against public participation. Again, a misuse of the judicial system trying to reduce uh, press freedom. And then finally, two uh, elements of this uh, very complex puzzle of attacks against freedom of expression are the, pro are the approval uh, of very draconian regulation against press freedom, and some of them with the allegedly good intentions of countering disinformation means information or hate speech, but these legislations being drafted in very generic terms and not following the recommendations of the universal system of human rights on this kind of regulations. So we have been monitoring legislation like that in at least 50 countries. And finally, uh, with all this perfect storm of problems against press freedom, a huge element of economic challenges for the news media sector to survive uh, all over the world. So uh, in a nutshell, we have the usual sorts of attacks against press freedom, I mean, physical attacks, killings, and uh, attacks during covering of protests, then uh, a rise on, on, on arbitrary detainment, uh, but also comp together with new formats like online harassment, or uh, the misuse of the judicial system, uh, regulatory problems, and then the economic problems. So uh, the basic uh, challenge of uh, this May 3rd or this World Press Freedom Day is how we can address these discussions also policy-wise, you know, what can be done uh, to uh, revert this negative trend in these many angles. So I will stop here. This is what we are communicating this, uh, the, this year World Press Freedom Day, we also launched uh, a global campaign uh, that many uh, newspapers uh, are and media outlets all over the world are reproducing, just to mention a few, The Guardian, El País, Le Monde, uh, Wall Street Journal, The New York Times, they are all reproducing these campaigns uh, throughout this week, many of them tomorrow, the World Press Freedom Day itself. And finally, tonight, uh, we are going to announce the laureates of the UNESCO Guillermo Cano World Press Freedom Prize. As you know, is the only press uh, prize under uh, the United Nations system. So tonight here in New York, 7.30, we will announce the laureates that were recommended by the International Independent Jury. Thanks. Thanks very much. Uh, we'll now turn to the press. Uh, yes, Edie. Uh, Thank you very much on behalf of the United Nations Correspondents Association for doing this briefing. My name is Edith Lederer from the Associated Press. A couple of questions. First, um, why is the UN commemoration today and not tomorrow on World Press Freedom Day itself? I got asked this. Secondly, um, you, UNESCO is obviously engaged in trying to reverse all these negative trends that you've outlined, but so far 
things seem to be getting worse and not better. What else needs to be done to actually try and seriously reverse this trend of, among other things, disinformation, harassment, killings, uh, to make a significant U-turn? Thank you. So thank you. So uh, the, the, the question of why today and not tomorrow, the World Press Freedom Day historically is a most stakeholder celebration. We want to stimulate as different partners as possible. I mean, journalists, media outlets, uh, governments interested in this discussion, uh, and the, of course the civil society to commemorate this. So in order to really stimulate the different celebrations all over the world with different time zones, uh, it was a strategy to kick off today, but for instance, tomorrow, only here in the city of New York, there are 45 different events all over the city uh, with different perspectives of this. So uh, today is, let's say, just the kicking off uh, of a, a global movement to uh, uh, highlight the importance of press freedom. So no particular reason side of uh, kicking off today and uh, making sure that the entire week will be a World Press Freedom Day week, uh, although, as you said, the official day is tomorrow. Uh, regarding the other question, uh, of course, I have underlined the, the, the bad news on the attacks, uh, but uh, if we look into a 30 years perspective when the day was first celebrate. We also have good news and we have things to celebrate thanks to the work of the, the several stakeholders, including the United Nations system. I can offer a few of them that are really meaningful. For instance, when the World Press Freedom Day was first celebrated, we had, we had only 12 countries in this planet with freedom of information laws. Today, there are 135. So this huge structural transformation on transparency and access to information is not minor. And it was something really pushed by uh, these efforts of, uh, of the multilateral system in terms of uh, enhancing press freedom. One of the big issues in terms of uh, safety of journalists are, is actually the high levels of impunity in the crimes against journalists. But 10 years ago, when we started the UN Plan of Action on Safety of Journalism, the issue of impunity, the impunity rate was 95%. So uh, out of the 10 killings of journalists, uh, 9.5 remained unresolved, I mean, with uh, almost 100% uh, of impunity rate. 10 years later, this later, statistic is 86%. So of course, this is still absurd. But uh, reducing impunity on home sites is a very challenging endeavor. So considering that in 10 years was a reduction of nine percentual points, uh, it's not good news, but it's some indicator that something is happening there. And uh, one of these elements is a strong engagement in the capacity building of judicial actors. So UNESCO has started 10 years ago with the UN Plan of Action, a, an initiative called the Judges Initiative, which has already trained 25,000 judges and prosecutors from 160 countries in these issues of freedom of expression. And of course, fighting impunity is fundamental to get the legal operators involved, otherwise you can't move the needle. But that said, uh, last year we, we, we commemorate in, in, a, in a conference in Vienna, or we commemorate, no, we marked uh, the 10th anniversary of the UN plan. And it was a moment to take stock on how we are going on the, what we call the policies of the three Ps, no prevention, protection, and prosecution of the crimes. Uh, so there are good news in the sense that there are, for instance, protection, of mechani protection mechanisms established in, uh, in relation to journalism in 50 countries, and this was really triggered with the approval of the UN plan 10 years ago. But uh, you are right, there are much more to be done, and uh, really the, the, the lessons learned in terms of where it's working is precisely when the policies are not only one of the pieces. 
uh, if you have only prevention but without protection and prosecution, it makes a difference but not a significant difference. If you have only protection but without prosecution of the crimes, the cycle of violence continues. So the message from the UN system is precisely to implement the three Ps version. And, and I don't know if you saw the, the video of the Secretary General this morning on opening the event. He underlined again the importance of implementing the plan uh, by all the stakeholders. Thank you. Thanks. Ivan? Thank you very much for this briefing, Yvonne Murray, RTE News, Ireland. I have two questions. The first question is, have you analysed, have you looked into at all, the, the impact of states that deny their own populations freedom of expression, having access and using free speech platforms to promote their own narrative? And I can give you an example. For example, uh, China and its use of Twitter, Facebook, name any platform you wish, uh, to, to use their own uh, state media to promote their own narrative whilst denying their own population access to freedom of expression. We don't have in UNESCO particular analysis regarding what you are just asking. What we have published that is a bit related, I guess, on what you are asking, in, the, in our last World Trends Report on Freedom of Expression is Media Development is that in recent years, we are monitoring an increased number of political leaders, but also religious leaders and celebrities, developing a narrative against journalism. So using expressions like, all journalism is fake news, or all journalism is corrupt, or all journalism is not true. And uh, when we did our research about the attacks of journalists covering protests, apparently there is a connection of these callings against journalism and actual violence against journalists. So what we have been monitoring is uh, an increasing attempt to undermine journalism as a central institution uh, for protecting human rights and for democracies. Um, and if you look into the acceptance speech of Maria Ressa and Dmitry Muratov when they received the Nobel Peace Prize, actually, because of journalism and because of the centrality of journalism for peace, as the Nobel uh, Peace Committee has, has stated, they also made reference of these, you know, on these narratives against journalism as a, as a central institution of our societies. But this is the, the ex most approximate uh, data we have uh, related to your question, but not specifically on what you have just asked. Okay, my second question is about funding. Um, looking back over the past 30 years, some, the majority of newsroom budgets have collapsed because funding streams have changed, they've disappeared in some cases. What is your uh, ideas for the future of journalism? How should it be funded in a way that keeps it separate from uh, state funding and keeps it uh, truly independent and global? Well, that's a very good question to which no one has a concrete answer, but at least we are trying to offer some drivers for this discussion. So last year, we, we commissioned uh, the Economist Intelligence Unit to look into what's going on in this phenomenon we call media viability, or actually the lack of media viability uh, in different parts of the world, uh, including with a series of researchers looking into some sorts of good practices that apparently are working across the, glo the globe on that. So the first part, as you said, is that 50% of the advertisement revenue of news media, according to this study published by the Economist Intelligence Unit and UNESCO, uh, were in the recent years, 50% uh, moved completely to only two internet companies. Uh, so it's a huge loss, and particularly uh, to only two companies that are actually channeling the advertisement that before was going to the news media and now basically going to Meta and Alphabet. So, and this is part of the problem. But then what to do, you know, how to protect journalism as an essential institution for democracy? So we then published 20 different elements that apparently are working. Uh, but all of them, they have a, a critical uh, 
discussion that is, as you were stating, how we, we produce these policies while keeping the editorial independence of journalism. Uh, some of those policies are related to taxpayers' money for journalism, uh, and apparently they have established independent ways of channeling taxpayers' money to journalism without coming to strings attached, but this is not easy. There are uh, policies of uh, recent policies in, diff in, a, in a couple of governments uh, approving laws where the, uh, the internet companies should negotiate with the news media that a transfer of resources to these news media. So, and this apparently is also uh, working in terms of stimulating uh, the, the, the local media. Uh, but again, it's, there is no one size fits all. So what we did with these studies is precisely publishing these good practices that apparently are working in different countries. But all the different questions we did for these, these uh, experiences, they came with the same kind of concern. It's not entirely a given that these different strategies uh, in the way, in the, in the long way, they will be sustainable and or they will uh, keep the editorial independence of the media. Uh, you, what UNESCO is saying is that absolutely urgent that we discuss ways to keep the media viability, the news media viability, because journalism is so essential for our society. Okay. Uh, Stefano? Thank you, Stefano Vaccara, Voce di New York. I will have so many questions, but uh, one that I asked before is uh, what UNESCO thinks about the case of uh, Julian Assange if he's a journalist, publisher, or a spy, because everybody says journalism is not a crime, and then uh, this is a big case that, is, uh, that everybody uh, you know, would like to know also from the UN. Uh, but then it's a kind of, I think it's a follow-up from my colleague, and this is about uh, freedom of expression, human rights, journalism, all things very important, but also very dangerous, and talking about propaganda, kills. We know what happened, for example, genocide, the genocide that we had more, I don't know, in Rwanda or other places, and even the, the, the war that happens, usually uh, journalism, or so-called journalism, is used as a weapon. Uh, so what, the, because the UNESCO is in charge to protect journalists, well, what UNESCO does to protect the public from propaganda? Two very complex questions. So uh, in terms of the specific, the, the discussion of specific cases, uh, we, uh, the system leaves the, the, the really remarks about very specific cases to the special rapporteurs on, on freedom of expression. And I understand they have already pronounced about this particular case. Now, overall, as I was mentioning before, we published last year a very strong policy briefing to all our member states, uh, really recommending them to follow the recommendations of the Civil and Political Rights Committee. It's a document called the General Comment Number 34 that states should refrain to use criminal law uh, to uh, resolve cases related to freedom of expression in general and with journalism in particular. So this is the overall recommendation, and if it fits to a particular case, this is our uh, overall opinion. No? And, and, and again, this is one of the uh, most... Uh, the, regarding the, the complicated trends, this is the one that is growing a lot. Um, in the case, for instance, of Daphna Caruana Galicia, the Maltese journalist that was assassinated, she had 45 lawsuits against her before her killing. So uh, there is a concrete later on connection uh, with uh, if it's not working to try to harass the journalist legally, what is the next step? So. Uh, the, the recommendation of the international system is very clear. States should decriminalize freedom of expression. 
which does not mean that if there is an issue, shouldn't be treated under civil laws, I mean, or with the right to reply or different measures, but even that, uh, the international courts, for instance, the Inter-American Court of Human Rights are saying that even in civil law, the, the decision should uh, follow the principle of necessity and proportionality. Because some civil law cases of fining a journalist in $40 million is the same as closing the, the newspaper or, or creating a censorship. So, uh, again, repeating the overall recommendation for us is uh, for the U universal system of human rights is freedom of expression shouldn't be treated under criminal law. Um, and uh, even in civil law should be followed necessity and proportionality. Now, on the, on the other question on, on, on the impacts uh, of uh, uh, speeches that are not protected by the international environment, uh, we just need to remind that there are specific instruments in the universal system of human rights to deal with that. So the Article 20 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights explicitly says that propaganda for war and uh, speech that leads to hatred is not a protected speech. The tricky question here is who decides on that and what are the judicial instruments for this? So uh, the International Human Rights Courts, they have created two tests, the, what is called the three-part test of legality, legitimacy, and proportionality. And for hate speech cases that are even more complex and connected with the genocide question that you asked, the Rabat Plan of Action has created a test of six parts. So what we are doing is really stimulating, particularly the, the regulators and the judges, to follow those tests when they are facing this kind of content. Now, with uh, the, the expansion of the internet, which of course is the biggest revolution for freedom of expression since Gutenberg invented the printing press, for good, but also with several negative externalities, these principles that are, for instance, in the, in the Article 20 of the ICCPR, they remain. However, it's much more complex to be uh, implemented because of the, uh, what is new here is not this information of hate speech. As soon as human beings have invented truth, they have invented lies. As soon as we have invented love, we have invented hate. So what is new is not this information of hate or hate speech. What is new is what we call the three Vs. Velocity, volume, and vir virality of all of these. No? So dealing with that is how we implemented the same principles in a very complex environment. So the entire system is very concerned about that. And in the case of UNESCO, we have launched a process uh, that's called Internet for Trust, where we are discussing global guidelines towards regulating uh, this, this, the, the digital platforms while protecting freedom of expression, who, as you can imagine, is not an easy challenge. This mode stakeholder discussion uh, already engaged more than, uh, for, we had a conference in Paris last February with 4,300 participants uh, from all the stakeholder groups, including the tech companies, trying to find uh, solutions for that. Now, one important, and I finish with this, one important element that is embedded in your question is that we need to look uh, in the comprehensive definition of freedom of expression that is in the Article 19 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Quite often, there is a confusion that freedom of expression equals only free speech. But if you look into the three verbs that define freedom of expression in the Universal Declaration, there is the verb, the, the right to impart, that is, speak, but it's also the right to seek and receive. So when the digital ecosystem is flooded with lies, with hate speech, the rights to seek and receive of everyone, for instance, when uh, citizens are voting on elections, those rights are also being undermined. So the role of the universal system of human rights is to protect this comprehensive view of freedom of expression, uh, and therefore, uh, we need to see the balancing act here. Uh, for instance, and I finish with this, next year we will have more than 90 elections in this planet, 9-0. Uh, and we need collectively to find solutions that these elections can take 
take place in a space that these three verbs, the right to seek, receive, and impart, they are being protected by the different stakeholders, including the United Nations system. Uh, Abdul uh, Thank you, sir. My name is Abdul Hamid Sayan from the Arabic Daily at Tutsil Arabi. In April, sir, there was 50 violations against Palestinian journalists, 36 by Israel, five by the Palestinian Authority, and nine by the media companies. Are you in touch with Israel? Did you draw its attention to the, the grave violations of Palestinian journalists? Eleven were beaten by the settlers, three were arrested, and one lady journalist was confined to a home arrest. Are you aware of these developments? Do you do anything about it? Thank you. Thank you for the question. So under the, the Sustainable Development Goal 1610, uh, you can see there is a specific indicator regarding safety of journalists mentioning not only the killings, uh, but all the other different sorts of violence against journalists. So this uh, indicator, the, the agency, the custodian agency for this indicator is the High Commissioner of Human Rights that has been leading the monitoring uh, of those violations, not only against journalists, but against human rights defenders and trade unionists. And UNESCO and ILO contribute to those statistics. The Director General of UNESCO condemned uh, every killing of journalists uh, that takes place and demands uh, the status of investigation on those killings. So overall, the universal system, following its different instruments, the Universal Periodical Review, or the VNR in the High Level Political Forum, or the specific Director General Report on the killings of journalists, uh, is monitoring the violence against all uh, journalists, not only in Palestine, in all our member states, and of course, underlining uh, under the umbrella of the UN Plan of Action on Safety of Journalists on the issue of impunity that these crimes uh, against journalists should be prosecuted by the relevant authorities. Uh, Pam Fox, CBS. Thank, thank you very much for the briefing. Um, as Foran said, it's Pamela from CBS. Uh, my question is a broad one, and that is, you are the, the UN World Freedom Day person. What do you think is the assessment right now? We're getting a lot of information that this is the worst year ever for journalists, that it's most killings and detentions. Why do you think this is happening and how bad is it? Thank you. Thank you for the question. I mean, just one correction is not the worst year ever, but it's, it's a trend that is coming at least from the, the last five years. I mean, the, the, the big question after, uh, as I was saying, uh, a Trends that were more positive for freedom of expression and press freedom when we first started these, these more consistent monitoring uh, 30 years ago. So the big, the big question is, is this just a hiccup or this is a trend that is going to get worse and worse? Our, we, and no one has a concrete answer for that. Our work as the universal system of human rights is to make sure that this is just a hiccup and trying to uh, guarantee that this is not being to consolidate as, uh, as not only a trend, as, a, as an unstable phenomenon of reduction of, of press freedom. Now, why this is happening, uh, there are a set of hypotheses and maybe it's not only one that can explain uh, our studies are showing, and I, I guess I mentioned some of them before, allow me to repeat, uh, this trend of political leaders and other kinds of leaders of uh, harassing journalism uh, in different ways, developing a narrative against journalism is one of the potential explanations for these bad trends. Um, this attempt with good intentions of bad intentions to regulate the online environment, again, 
may be because of legitimate concerns like uh, public health issues, but doing that not in alignment with the international law standards is another reason. I mean, bad regulation is generating uh, self-censorship, is generating a reduction of free speech uh, all over the world. So the, the regulatory uh, elements are, are part of this explanation. Third element I was saying and was questioned also here by one of your colleagues is related to the economic challenges of the, of the media sector. So um, reducing uh, the capacity uh, or the deterioration of the labor conditions of journalism and journalists is a problem. And finally, to not go too long on this list, there is a complexity uh, of the perpetrators of violence against journalists. Uh, when we started this monitoring many years ago, the main cause of journalists' killings in the world was journalists covering conflicts. And now this is the, the, the minority of the killings are journalists covering armed conflicts. The 90% of the journalists killed are journalists, uh, local journalists covering local issues, human rights violation, corruption, illegal mining, environmental problems, and so on. And uh, the perpetrators of this violence are not only state actors, they are organized crime, drug lord lords, uh, environmental criminals. So the complexity of trying to develop policies to tackle uh, such a, a diverse puzzle, <coughs> excuse me, of uh, perpetrators of this violence is perhaps another potential explanation why we are we are unfortunately witnessing this this backlash against freedom of expression in, in all over the world. Thank you. Very helpful. Thank you. Uh, I believe that's all the questions we have for now. So I would like once more to thank our guest, uh, Guillermo Canela de Souza uh, de Souza Godoy. Thanks very much for your uh, for your briefing and uh, and. I hope uh, the rest of the day goes well. Thank you so much. Well, please enjoy the rest of the event in the UNGA and in the website of the World Press Freedom Day. If you are interested, you can have access to all the 45 other events that are taking place in New York this week on, on Press Freedom. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, and, and just a reminder that we will next...